With many of us working from home during the pandemic, I bet our employers want to know if we're earning our keep. They used to be able to keep tabs on us when we were in the office, but now it seems easy enough for employees to slack off without their bosses being able to actually see if they're on the job. But are employees really slacking off? I'm Jeff Gallick, and in this episode of Data Demystified, we're going to learn to intuitively understand how statistical models can help us answer these types of questions, how to think about precision and estimation more generally, and just how much workers really are slaving away in their home offices. This chart shows one of the key findings from a recent academic study looking at over 3 million workers in 21,000 companies from all around the world. Among other things, what the authors of this study found was that remote workers are actually working more than they were before the pandemic. They compared the amount of hours spent working before lockdown order was placed for the city where the worker happened to be to the amount of hours spent working after that lockdown, when everyone was working from home. Overall, they concluded that after going on lockdown, the workday was about 8.2% longer, which translated into an extra 48 and a half minutes more of work each day. On a personal note, I'm not surprised by these findings. I found that focusing on work while home, especially with my kids running around, is really hard. So I'm just not as productive as I was when I had the luxury of sitting in my office on campus. This does beg the question of whether those extra 48 and a half minutes of work time are actually very productive, but that's getting a bit off topic. In any case, this is a really interesting chart, and I want to walk you through it so we're all on the same page. That yellow line represents the best estimate of how much extra time was spent working compared to one week prior to the workers being required to work from home. It's a bit more complex than this, but oversimplifying a bit, if you look at all 3 million workers studied and take the average of how much they worked each week, that's roughly this yellow line. You can see the change in hours worked reflected by this yellow line being higher on the right side than on the left side. Okay, I admit that the complexity is really quite important for making this estimation worthwhile. In the actual paper, the authors used some sophisticated statistical models to allow them to make adjustments to the estimates from that graph based on things like which city someone lives in, which company they work for, and a bunch of other important variables. All of this helps them come up with a more accurate estimate of how much people worked. But for the sake of understanding the intuition of all this, we don't need all that complexity right now. Anyway, you can see that before lockdown, there was some change in how much people worked each day, but practically that change was pretty small. After lockdown, however, there was a lot more going on. Some weeks workers spent more time on the job than others, but if you pull across all eight weeks following lockdown, you get that original estimate of an extra 8.2% spent working. That's all pretty straightforward. In the simplest version of this, if you want to know how much more people worked, just count. Before lockdown, they worked about 9.8 hours a day, and after lockdown, they worked about 10.6 hours a day. By the way, the way that this was determined was by looking at what the earliest and latest work email was sent for any person. So if you sent your first work email at 8 a.m. and your last one at 6 p.m., that was considered a 10-hour workday. That's not a perfect window into how long a workday is, but since that approach was used both before and after lockdown periods, we can still learn quite a bit. In any case, this all seems easy, except what we really want to know is not just how much more these particular workers worked, but rather we want to know how much all workers worked. In other words, the 3 million workers is certainly quite a lot. It's not even close to being every worker out there who is now stuck in their home offices. To be clear, we don't need to ask every single person in the world about their working hours to get a good window into how lockdowns have changed their habits. Not only would that be impossible to accomplish, but it isn't necessary. Assuming, and this is a big assumption, that the workers we do have information on are a reasonably representative cross-section of the entire working population we're interested in, we can learn about everyone from just a relatively small group like this one. That's actually the entire point of statistics, to make statements about populations while only looking at a few data points. The challenge is that when we do that, we really can't come up with a super precise estimate like the one described in the yellow line in this chart. Instead, we have to add some humility to our estimate and admit that the group of people we collected data about, just by dumb luck, may not be a good reflection of all working people. And one way we do that is by introducing what is known as a confidence interval. In this study, the authors do just that, and so I'll bring it up here. That orange band of color represents how uncertain the authors of this study are about any of these specific estimates depicted by the yellow line. Remember, we don't really care all that much about the working hours of the workers that happen to be depicted in this graph. Instead, what we really care about is what these workers can tell us about all workers. But to really get an intuition for how that works and where that band comes from, we need to take a big step back and first think about how we learn about everyone just by looking at a few people. Before we get into that, if you like what you see, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content that I put out. With that said, let's work on the intuition behind model estimation. The whole point of a statistical model is to tell us something interesting about a population we care about. A population is just whatever we decide the totality of what we care about is. That could be something like every iPhone that comes off an assembly line, 
every monarch butterfly that migrates across North America, or every worker who's affected by lockdown orders. The challenge with all these is that it's nearly impossible to get information from every single unit in a population because there's just too many to deal with. If we want to check to see if every one of the millions of iPhones manufactured can withstand being dropped from a few feet off the ground, we can't really do that. Forgetting that no one wants to buy a new iPhone that was dropped on the ground, that would just take way too much time. If we want to track every single one of the tens of millions of monarch butterflies that migrate across North America to better understand their amazing behavior, well, we couldn't do that either. Catching that many would be impossible, and doing so might actually disrupt their natural behavior. And if we want to understand how the working habits of hundreds of millions of workers who are now working from home has changed, we can't just ask every single one of them. Not only would most not bother to tell us, but the expense of asking would likely exceed any benefit in the knowledge we gained. But if we still want to answer these questions, we can. We can do that by making a pretty critical assumption that a representative sample of our population is actually a really good proxy for the population itself. Let me unpack that for you with an example. Imagine that we have 100 people and we want to know what fraction of them are left-handed. That's easy enough to do. We can just ask all of them and learn that 12 are left-handed. That might take us a few minutes and we have the answer to our question. In this case, the population is all 100 people and we don't need any statistics at all since we can just collect information on everyone. For those of you who understand significance testing, we actually don't need it here. Significance testing is needed when you have a sample, but if you're measuring the entire population, you can just count. There's nothing else to do. But now imagine that we have 100 million people. We could ask them all which hand is dominant, but that would take a very long time and would require a whole lot of resources. So we take a different approach. Instead of asking everyone, we ask just a few people. Then we hope that the fraction of left-handed people sampled is the same as the fraction of left-handed people in the 100 million person population. But there are two big ways in which any conclusion about how many people are left-handed in the population could be a problem. Let's start with a problem that could emerge with what we call a non-representative sample. I actually talk about this a fair bit in a different video, so I'll go through this quickly here, but if you want more depth, I'll link to that video below. The way in which I pick the people to ask about which hand is dominant matters a lot in our ability to say something about the population I'm interested in. If I go to the left dorium and only ask people there, I think we all intuitively understand that whatever I learn there probably doesn't translate to the population. So let's do better. What if instead I assign every one of our 100 million people a number, and then have a machine that randomly picks a bunch of people to actually ask if they are left-handed or right-handed? This is what we call a random sample, and in theory, it should make it so that the people I actually talk to are a good cross-section of the entire population. But even here, we can get unlucky. Let's assume for a second that exactly 12% of the population is left-handed. In a perfect world, the people our machine will select to ask about which hand is dominant will exactly match that 12% number. But the problem is that even the best machine will, just by dumb luck, mess up sometimes. Sometimes our sample will have 11% left-handed people, sometimes it'll have 14%, and so on. That bad luck isn't because someone did something wrong, but just because when we have something random, unexpected things can occur. The point is that just by dumb luck, our sample may not perfectly reflect the population. It should be close, but it's not going to be perfect. The second problem is of what we call sample size, or how many people you actually ask. And this should be pretty intuitive too. If I ask just 10 people if they are left-handed, we all kind of understand that I can't claim that the rate of left-handedness for those 10 people is a good reflection of the left-handedness of my 100 million person population. But what if I ask 100 people? Or 1,000 people? Will that be enough? The key to answering this is understanding that our sample, regardless of how big it is, tells us something about the population with uncertainty. In other words, even if the 1,000 people we ask, exactly 12% come back left-handed, that estimate is actually just a guess. More precisely, we can say that based on our 1,000 people sample, we think somewhere around 12% of the population is left-handed. We can't quite say that exactly 12% are left-handed, but that winds up being a really good starting point. The hedging of our estimate gets better as we have more people. At the extreme, if we ask every one of our 100 million people, well, we get rid of uncertainty entirely. But that's an unreasonable task. And if we ask just one person, well, we all understand that that's not enough. But the more people we ask, the less we have to hedge our estimate. And that hedge is what we call a confidence interval. In most cases, we talk about 95% confidence intervals. The exact definition and math behind all of this is a bit complicated, but you can think of it as our best guess at the range of what is most likely to be true. In this case, that's the fraction of people that are left-handed. So how many observations do we need to be reasonably confident? It turns out it's a lot less than you think. As long as our sample is representative, meaning we don't have that first problem I talked about before, a few hundred people will actually do the trick just fine in almost all cases. For this example about handedness, if the truth is that exactly 12% of all people are left-handed, this is what our 95% confidence interval looks like depending on how many people we ask. So if you ask just 100 people and find that 12 of them are left-handed, your confidence interval tells you that your best guess at what the population fraction of left-handed people is is somewhere between 5.6 and 18.4%. But if you ask 500 people, that range narrows to 9.2 to 14.8%. 
If you keep going up and get to say a thousand people, you actually don't get much improvement at all. You now get a range between 9.9 and 14%, and that range doesn't get really much smaller. Let me show you just one more chart so you understand. This chart now shows how wide that confidence umbrella is depending on how many people you talk to. The bigger the value, the less precise is our guess at what fraction of the percentage of the population is left-handed. What I want you to notice is that the line gets very flat as you ask more people. In other words, the benefit to asking more people basically goes away after some point around here. Generally though, as you ask more people, you get a slightly tighter range for your confidence interval, but almost all the benefit of confidence happens early on, somewhere in this range. The point of all this is to say that as you ask more people, as you have more data, your certainty in what the population looks like improves. Remember, we don't really care about the 100, 500, or 1,000 people that we actually talk to. We only care about what those people can tell us about the entire population. And as it turns out, they can tell us a whole lot. So let's bring this back to the first graph we had about hours worked before and after lockdown orders went into effect. That orange band is the author stated 95% confidence interval for how many hours the population worked on any given week. Sometimes their estimate is really precise and sometimes it's wider. Most likely this is a reflection of the fact that they just happen to have more data for some weeks relative to others. And in fact, if we go back to the original estimate of an extra 8.2% worked after a lockdown, that also has a confidence interval around it. If you dig a bit into the paper, you see that their actual estimate is that people worked somewhere between 7.1 and 9.3% more after lockdown. Critically, that's a population level estimate. In other words, their best guess is that an increase of 8.2% happened, but they're more humble than that. They realize that their prediction is a good one. After all, they do have 3 million observations, but even that might be flawed. So they give us a range of what is likely in the population of all workers. More generally, I hope that you see that this is a recipe for how to think about any type of statistical model. These models are meant to tell us something about the population, but all we can ever really learn about, in most cases, is a small sample. If we want to know how well that sample can tell us about the population, we need some humility, and we do that by adding confidence intervals to our predictions. I glossed over a few really important points here to get to the heart of confidence intervals, but if you want me to dig in more to things like the central limit theorem, sampling bias, model fit, and sample size estimation, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to make videos meant just for you, my viewers. Finally, if you found this interesting, please take a moment to like the video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon to get notified when new content comes out.